Okay, so this is where we ended last time. Um, we're in the course of deriving uh, conditions that hold at discontinuity surfaces that can be non-material surfaces propagating through the material. And we got as far as deducing that in the definition of the dissipation, which is the rate of change, sorry, the, the power supply minus the rate of change of total energy, kinetic plus strain energy, um, in, in, the, in the dissipation we have not only the volumetric contribution that we talked about previously, uh, but also a surface contribution coming from the, uh, the, the discontinuity surface. <clears throat> Small s is the intersection of pi or material region with capital S, the propagating discontinuity surface. And we arrived at this result here, equation seven, where u is the speed of the discontinuity surface relative to the reference configuration. <clears throat> and phi is the total energy density, that's the kinetic energy density plus the strain energy density. Okay, so. I've numbered about, uh, several equations. Here's equation seven in the sequence. And now the, the job, we, we could stop here if we want, of course, this is perfectly valid in general, but we can put this into a more illuminating form if we manipulate it using, for example, um, a definition of, so we, we, have, we had previously the definition of a discontinuity, the difference between the the, the limits of a function as you approach from the plus region, subtract the limit from the minus region, right? We can also talk about the average of those limits at the discontinuity surface. So the average of the plus limit and the minus limit. <clears throat> and then uh, you can easily demonstrate for yourselves if you have any functions f and g, it could be scalar or tensor or vector functions. The product here, um, <clears throat> F and G, the discontinuity in the product, that is the jump in the product, is the product of the jump in F with the average of G plus the average of F times the jump in G. So I'll leave it to you to show that very tri trivial equality to yourselves. So we can, for example, use that in connection with this first term in equation seven. Uh, we can write the jump in P transpose V as the jump in P transpose, the average of V, plus the average of P transpose, the jump in V, all inner products with the normal to the discontinuity surface. <clears throat> and then, so this is some tensor op operating on a vector dotted with another vector, just use the definition of transpose to put the transpose of this tensor, transpose of P transpose, jump, again, next to N, and then take a dot with V. Okay, we do the same thing over here. This is V dot, the average of P on N. And now this is useful because we have formulas for coming from the linear momentum balance. Remember the jump condition associated with the linear momentum balance was the jump in the traction, P-O attraction, is balanced by uh, minus the, the normal speed of the discontinuity surface times the referential density times the jump in material velocity. We called that equation five prime previously. <clears throat> and last time we had an equation six relating the jump in material velocity to the jump in the deformation gradient. So we can make use of these results here. Here we, here we have now the jump in velocity dotted with the average of the velocity. And that's interesting, you can show to, to yourselves very quickly, quickly that that's this, the jump in these half, one half the jump in the squared norm of the velocity, <clears throat> v dot v. So I'll leave that to you to verify. And that's interesting because that starts to look like a kinetic energy term when you combine with the referential density. So we expect that to balance out a contribution from the kinetic energy density here in the second term of equation seven. And indeed, that's what happens. So we'll be able to, by, by this procedure, we'll be able to eliminate the kinetic energy contribution. <clears throat> so this jump 
that we started with here, the left-hand side of this equation, is simply now minus a half rho kappa normal speed jump in v squared. Remember, whenever u is non-zero, rho kappa must be continuous. So we can sneak it back inside the, the jump without affecting the result. And then we have here average p inner product jump in f. And we have here a kinetic energy type of term multiplied by the normal speed. <clears throat> to simplify the second term here, we can use the fact that the jump in f was <clears throat> This vector is small f we, we spoke of previously in this rank one formula for the jump in f. That's the, Lejeune, the, the, the uh, rather the Hadamard lemma pertaining to discontinuity surfaces. And little f then is just the jump in f operating on the normal, and then we take the tensor product with n. So if we make this inner product here, this inner product we can regard as a tensor inner product, another tensor which is a tensor product of two vectors. And for that, we can use this generic formula, A inner product vector A tensor product vector B is the same as A dot tensor A operating on B. You can verify that standard formula using components if you like. <clears throat> um, so this inner product is average P on N dotted with jump in F on N. We can use the definition of transpose again <clears throat> to write that in this way. Put the F transpose to the right of the dot. And then we can, re if we remember that formula, I think we called it equation eight. The jump in a product is the jump in the first factor average of the second plus the average of the first factor jump in the second. So we can write this in terms of the jump in the product and so on. And then we can invoke again that traction jump condition resulting from the linear momentum balance. That was equation five prime. So we can write this term. This combination from equation six is minus u squared vector f which was the jump in deformation gradient operating the, on the normal. So that's the jump, doubles, double bracket. <clears throat> so we have a minus and a minus and another minus. That's three minuses give you a minus. And we get n dot jump f transpose p, all this stuff here. And we can make a further simplification. We have this average of the limits of f transpose times the jump in f. We can use the same equation eight to write that this way, jump in F transpose F, which is the right Cauchy-Green deformation, minus jump in F transpose average F. <clears throat> now, what matters here is what when we operate this on N and then take a, for, a, a dot product with N. So here is, this, here is this N, although I don't have the subscript S, I should have put in the subscript N sub S. That's this, then minus this. Use the definition of transpose here, and then use it again to put this F transpose in front of jump Fn, we get this. That's equal to that, so we get that this is one half of this. Okay, so now we're just about ready. <clears throat> Here was our expression for the surface contribution to the dissipation. Reminding you what phi is, that's the total mechanical energy density. <clears throat> We've sorted out this business here in this way. We've just written it this way. Plus this term now, and then u times the jump in so phi. Here is the kinetic energy contribution which you see neatly cancels this, this term we've just, uh, we've just had here previously, this term right here, okay? Okay. And where am I? Yeah. <clears throat> so the jump in side, the energy, I can write 
as n dot identity n because n, n is a unit vector, so that just gives the number one here. So I could sneak this jump inside the dot products with, with n. <clears throat> then I have the minus f transpose p jump from before, and then have this remaining business here coming from this term, which had a u squared in front of it somewhere in the previous work. Okay, so finally we get this expression for the surface contribution to the to the uh, dissipation. So you can think of this as a, the dissipation density per unit area on the discontinuity surface. It involves the interface speed u in a it, it's an odd function of u. Here, here's u appearing here and here it is again. u u squared is u, u cubed of course so this is <clears throat> an odd function of u. It involves the jump in our Eschel v tensor and also the jump in the right Cauchy Green deformation. Or if you like with that, you can put the half in front, put that here, and you get the jump in the Lagrange strain without the half. Okay. Um, at this stage, you might ask, well, you know, what if we had started with an assumption that you know we have we had our minus region and our plus region and u was defined positive in the direction of the normal n pointing away from the minus region. What if we had interchanged the plus and minus regions in that discussion so that n pointed away from the plus region instead of away from the minus region and then u would be the opposite of this u. Well <clears throat> The sense of n doesn't matter because it occurs, occurs quadratically. If you change the definition of the plus and minus regions, which after all is just a labeling, matter of labeling, you will change the sign of u. So u will go to minus u, and u cubed here will go to minus u cubed. But also the, the definition of the jump will reverse its sign also, right? So those two reversals cancel each other out. So this formula, as you would expect, doesn't depend on how you've defined the plus or minus regions in this entire discussion. Okay, <clears throat> so it's, it's a well-defined formula in other words. And it tells you that not only <clears throat> does the Eshelby tensor play a crucial role in the volumetric density of dissipation, it also appears again in the form of a discontinuity in the in contributing uh, dissipation in the, uh, via a uh, discontinuity surface, propagating surface, <clears throat> like a shock wave or a phase boundary. Um, first thing to notice is that there's no dissipation associated with the discontinuity surface if that surface is a material surface, because then U is zero, right? U is the speed of the discontinuity surface in the reference configuration. If that's zero, then obviously, this is zero. So there's uh, a discontinuity across a material surface does not contribute to the dissipation, okay? It's only an evolving surface, evolving relative to the material. Okay, so we put it back all together in our formula for the dissipation. We'll require this being our surrogate, say for the second law of thermodynamics in this mechanical, purely mechanical setting, we require the dissipation to be non-negative for every every sub-volume of the reference configuration, in other words, where pi here is a material region, of course, okay? So we could take, for example, pi to be pi one, which had the property that its intersection with the discontinuity surfaces, the surface was empty. That means this integral doesn't appear. And then we have this in integral, volume integral, non-negative for all such sub-volumes, localize that, you get the integrand non-negative at every point in the reference configuration apart from the discontinuity surface, right? Off the discontinuity surface. And that is just the inequality we had before because we derived a formula for that D dissipation in terms of the Eshelby tensor and the material derivative of plastic deformation or here in inverse plastic deformation, okay. <clears throat> On the other hand, if you choose pi to be pi two, which has a non-empty intersection with the discontinuity surface, 
we would get this formula with the, with the second integral there. We can do what we've done before, which is consider a sequence of such pi's that collapse successively onto the discontinuity surface, assuming this integrand is bounded in that region, then the volume here would disappear in that limit. The first integral would disappear, and we would just get this inequality, where small s again is the intersection of capital S with the pi that we've chosen. And because we can choose such a pi arbitrarily, that means small s is an arbitrary subsurface of the discontinuity surface. We can localize again to conclude that the surface dissipation density per unit area must be non negative at every point on the discontinuity surface. Okay. Okay, let's look back then at the structure of this formula. <clears throat> so, this formula is. is of crucial importance in the study of phase transitions uh, and, and, in the, and in the study of um, shock waves as well. If you look at it, we can imagine, well, this certainly depends on you as well as all the other variables that are present here. So we, if we think of it as a function of u, uh, together with the other variables in that formula, Let's, let's imagine fixing the other variables in that formula so that this then becomes just a function of u. <clears throat> then the dissipation inequality we just derived, this one, says that the f of u is not negative, and obviously it's zero when u equals zero from its definition. So that means, uh, in particular, you, you see that uh, f of u involves u and u cubed, it's a smooth function of u. So if this is true, that means then f has a minimum at u equals zero, which means its derivative is zero when u equals zero. If you take the derivative of this function with respect to u, and then put u equals zero, you'll get a contribution from here, but if you then put u equals zero, this contribution will disappear, and you just ultimately end up with this condition here. So this is the condition that has to be satisfied for a state, a condition that we have so-called, that we call phase equilibrium, in which the phase interface, or the shock wave, if you like, is not moving if it's stationary, <clears throat> if its velocity is zero, okay, then at such an interface, or a discontinuity surface, we have to have this jump condition satisfied. <clears throat> and uh, this is a famous jump condition called the Eshelby Maxwell jump condition. <clears throat> Maxwell, because it first arose in the context of fluid phase equilibria, where you have coexistent uh, phases of the fluid, one, one liquid and one gas. Th in that context, this boils down to the classical thermodynamic phase equilibrium condition that people in uh, thermodynamics are very familiar with. <clears throat> okay, so I wanted to mention this, uh, this condition and its derivation because we've already had a look at the notion of a surface dislocation, which involved discontinuous fields. And so to complete the story, we should have uh, a complete theory then of discontinuous fields, which was the motivation for this discussion. Hopefully we may come back to this later on in the course, depending on how things go. <clears throat> okay, I think someone before asked about, well, what about the interpretation of stability in the, in the setting of plasticity? Remember, um, we talked, when we were talking about pure elasticity, we talked about the relationship between asymptotic stability and minimum energy. Of course, that discussion only makes sense in the context of conservative loads. Otherwise, there's no total energy to minimize, right? <clears throat> and then you further investigated this issue in connection with your homework, where 
homework one, I think it was, where you added a, a dissipative effect in the form of viscosity to uh, establish the dissipative nature uh, or, or establish the, uh, the notion that um, viscosity has the effect of dissipating energy. Well, plasticity has the same effect. So let's look at the case of conservative loads, otherwise this discussion doesn't make sense. For conservative loads, if you recall, those are loads, traction and body force, to take them together, which are such that there exists a load potential, call it L, associated with the body, the reference configuration kappa m time t, such that the power of the, of the forces acting on the, on the body is the time derivative of that L. Okay, so we've had that discussion before. That's, that's just it, that's, the, that's conservative loading in a nutshell. Then the question is to find, well, conditions under which there exists such an L, and, and then perhaps if you, uh, one, one uh, task might be to, cat, to catalog different kinds of loading for which there exists an L. And so we've had some, I sent around some literature about that, which I encourage you to read. It's an interesting subject. <clears throat> Okay, so supposing we have a conservative problem where, in other words, uh, the loads are such that there exists a load potential. And if you look back on, I think it's page 79, according to my review of the notes, um, you can write the energy balance in this way, the dissipation plus the time derivative of kinetic plus the total potential energy consisting of the strain energy minus the load potential right? That would be zero. If you look at, look up our definition of dissipation and combine it with this definition of the total potential energy, you will see that this is just the mechanical energy balance, right? Uh, just a different way of stating it. Okay, so clearly that dissipation, and as we've seen, plasticity is a source of dissipation. That'll be true then if and only, so, so if this is non-negative, then this derivative has to be non-positive, right? And this then is the total mechanical energy, kinetic plus potential of the, of the body and the loads together. This is dissipated in the sense that as a process evolves in time, this decreases or never increases. If, this, if we have strict dissipation, then we'll have a strict reduction in the total mechanical energy. And of course, we can add viscous effects to this discussion also, as we did in the homework, right? So not just plasticity, but we can have viscosity as well. So let's see. The, the idea then about asymptotic stability, if you, if you recall, was the, the following. Um, suppose we have a dynamical trajectory. The unknowns, the variables in this problem are the deformation and the plastic deformation, the regular deformation function, chi, and the plastic deformation, or equivalently, the inverse plastic deformation, k. So that will evolve, that, that, we'll call that a dynamical state. It evolves with time. Let's suppose it starts at some initial time t0, where chi takes the value chi naught, a function only of x because time is fixed. K takes the value k naught, some initial condition. And let's stipulate that chi dot, the material velocity, is zero at that initial time. So you have the body, you're holding it in the state of zero velocity, although it need not be in equilibrium at that time. It can have zero, let's, let's stipulate that it has zero velocity at, at the initial state, even though it may not be an equilibrium state. Right? You can imagine doing that with a, pen, a pendulum, for example, right? You hold it in some configuration, which would not be in equilibrium in the absence of you holding it there, but the velocity at that configuration is zero, and then you let it go. Suppose the trajectory is such that it, it, it tends, it starts at this initial condition and tends to 
this state with chi sub infinity, k sub infinity, as time goes to infinity. And that the velocity tends to zero in that same limit. Well, that means the kinetic energy would be zero at the initial state because the velocity is zero there, and also at large time as time tends to infinity. So if you integrate this, you're going to get the kinetic energy plus the potential energy at large time is less than or equal to its initial value at time t zero. But the kinetic terms drop out at the initial and final times. So you're just left with the total potential energy at large time is less than or equal to its initial value at time zero. So this means, of course, the limit of the potential energy as time goes to infinity. So in this sense, again, the, this notion of asymptotic stability correlates with minimization of the potential energy, just as it does in ordinary elasticity. In ordinary elasticity, we don't have any plastic evolution, so k is fixed. So there would be no dissipation unless you account for it explicitly by adding a viscosity or other dissipative effects like diffusion or something else. Okay, there are, of course, an endless number of physical effects that can give rise to dissipation. So in the case of pure elasticity, it corresponds to freezing the K. K doesn't depend on time. And then to get dissipation, you would add, you would account for that by, through some other effect other than plasticity. And you'll get the same conclusion. Here, this energy comparison, in general, will involve a comparison of these two fields, k infinity, uh, chi infinity and k infinity, with these two fields, chi naught and k naught. Okay, so you're minimizing with respect to chi and k as two independent variables. Okay. Of course, you can still imagine, you can still discuss the situation where k where you have a process in which you know you have some plastic deformation, but it it's fixed. Say it doesn't evolve. You're not yielding the material any further, and then the, the still the energy this energy comparison still applies. <clears throat> so that's to answer a question I think uh, maybe Zach posed posed previously. So let me um, get rid of this one and. Can you see this new new slide, everybody, or not? Yep. Yes, we can see that. Okay. 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 That's that was easy enough. <clears throat> it's about time I learned how to do that. Okay. So let's go back to this dissipation inequality and see if we can say something definite about constitutive equations. So we had this volumetric dissipation inequality. Defined in terms of the Eschelby tensor given here. Notice that this is a purely referential tensor, that is to say, it has both legs in the reference configuration. So if you do if you were to use Cartesian notation, you would write it this way, where the components are just these. F transpose P would have components F I A P I B, for example. <clears throat> um, okay. I'm in, what I'm interested in doing is deriving a version of the Eschelby tensor, but not, but not, not, not purely referential with both legs in the reference configuration, but one which pertains to the so-called intermediate state. In other words, I would like a version of the Eschelby tensor that has both legs in the intermediate state, this vector space associated with the intermediate state. We called it kappa sub i before. So this is based on kappa, but we, I'd like one based on kappa sub i for reasons that will become clear as we move forward. How would I do that? Well, it's not at all clear how we do that. Let's start by thinking, well, what would the Eschelby tensor be if we imagine choosing a reference configuration that happens to coincide with the current configuration at some fixed time? And let's suppose epsilon star is, is that Eschelby tensor. So if, 
people in finite elements refer to this idea as the updated Lagrangian method. Perhaps you've all heard of that, where you, you update your reference configuration to the current configuration, and then you move on to the next time step and repeat the process successively. So that this is essentially the notion of an updated, the updated Lagrangian description. Okay, so the the, re, the choice of reference configuration is arbitrary. I can freeze the time. Of course, the current configuration is whatever it is. You can't alter that, but you can freeze the time and then choose the reference configuration to coincide with that configuration at that particular chosen time, right? Because the reference is the only requirement in choosing the reference is it should be in one-to-one -one relation with the material points of the body. And that's certainly true if you choose it to be the, the configuration that, that appears at some time. <clears throat> so just by looking at this, let's see. The energy here, this, is, this was the energy per unit reference volume. We've replaced that by the energy per unit current volume. F would be the identity because the deformation gradient relative to the reference configuration is the identity, right? That's the identity map. And P, which is T F star, F is the identity, that would, re that would reduce to the Cauchy stress. So this, this is the, the SLB tensor obtained by taking the current configuration as the, at a given time as the reference. And here is our definition of, of capital Psi in terms of the energy density per unit current volume, if you remember, and then this determinant F factor, J sub F. <clears throat> okay, so now I can go back to some another choice of reference configuration for which this epsilon is the Eschelby tensor. And I can relate it to this epsilon star. First of all, if I multiply through by JF, I get this capital Psi. And then I need an F transpose and an F inverse transpose to, to get me back to the identity here. And let's see, the F transpose I need here, I use P is JFT F inverse transpose. And I can see immediately that this is the relationship between the S will be transfer based on any choice of reference configuration and the S will be transfer based on the current configuration. Okay, so <clears throat> if I could easily now immediately write down the S will be transfer based on the use of the intermediate state, right, that we talked about. To get from the current state to the reference, I used a that the appropriate map is the deformation gradient F, right? To get from the reference to the current. To get from the intermediate to the current, I replace F by H, the elastic part of the deformation gradient. And without any work whatsoever, I can just use this formula immediately and transcribe it here, replace the F by H. I don't touch epsilon star, but then I get a new F will be tensor. I'll call it epsilon prime because I'm running out of notation. That's the SLB tensor based on the intermediate state as reference. Now, why bother? Well, if I if I work this through, so I get a, I get the small psi here that I had before with the JH. That's my W of H that I defined previously, which is the energy density quote per unit volume unquote of the intermediate state, even though the intermediate state has no volume in Euclidean space, right? It's just it's a dust cloud of unstressed material points. <clears throat> Nevertheless, this is well defined because H is well defined. Okay, then I get H transpose. So the J H inverse transpose is the cofactor of H, right? And the T in here, T H star is the Piola stress based on the intermediate state as reference. Just like TF star is the Piola stress, capital P, based on the reference configuration. So, and if you remember, the Piola stress based on the intermediate state is DW, DH. We've had that discussion. <clears throat> and because of, we had this argument about the symmetry of the Cauchy stress, 
which enable us to conclude, con to conclude that W depends on H through the elastic strain, one half quantity H transpose H minus identity. And we went through the exercise of showing that dw dh is just then h times du dE, where u is the u of e is the same as w of h. <clears throat> so then we have h transpose h. Okay. And so you see, now we have the re the, the motivation for introducing this new Eschelby tensor. It depends only on the elastic deformation. It's purely elastic in origin. Whereas the original definition jumbled up everything together, right? Because the psi involved both F and K, F itself involves H and K and so on. So that was kind of a, it did, did not, that original definition did not help us to separate out the different effects of elasticity or plasticity. This version of the Eschelby tensor is purely elastic. And of course, w, uh, w of h is the same as u at e, and h transpose h is identity plus 2e. So this whole thing depends only on the elastic strain. <clears throat> okay. Okay, well, I need a formula for the dissipation now, which I'd like to recast it in terms of this epsilon prime. Well, let's see. I use this. I use this formula to go from the current to the reference Eschelby tensors. Likewise, I use this formula to go from the current to the intermediate Eschelby tensors. <clears throat> well, I could swap out the role. I, I could, instead of using the current, I could use the intermediate. And instead of using the intermediate here, I could use the reference, right? H takes me from the intermediate to the current and G, the plastic part of the deformation gradient, takes me from the reference to the intermediate. So without, any more, without doing any work, I can deduce that this relationship between the original Eschelby tensor based on the reference configuration and this new one based on the intermediate. <clears throat> okay, I don't need to do any more work at all. I just need to swap out the relevant variables. And I could recast this in terms of K, which I want to do because of my formula for the dissipation involved K. Just remember that G is the inverse of K and you just get this immediately. Okay, so the volumetric dissipation B was equal to referential Eschel B <clears throat> in a product K dot K inverse. Um, let's rework that a little bit. I want to take, I want to factor out a k dot on the right of the dot product. To do that, I'll make use of this fact. A dot product BC is the trace of A C transpose B transpose, which is the same as AC transpose dot B. So letting B be k dot, I can factor it out on the right like this. Okay, so like this rather, this line right here. Now, if I look at this, this epsilon and put a K inverse transpose on the right, then I get rid of this and I just have this. And let's see, I'd like to clean that up a bit. Let's use the trace definition of inner product. K inverse transpose epsilon prime K dot transpose, the trace of all that is equal to this. So I can, remember in the, in the trace, you can interpose, interchange the factors without, without changing anything. So let's take the first factor to be K inverse transpose and the second factor to be the product epsilon prime times K dot transpose. And just swap, just interchange those factors and I get this. Then from the same trace definition of inner product, that's the same as epsilon prime dot the transpose of the second factor, which is k inverse k dot. And so I had, and I had this factor j sub k here. This, this was the dissipation. So if I multiply three by j k, I get this. So this is an alternative form of expression for the dissipation using this intermediate Eschel B tensor, which turns out to be more convenient for what we want to do later. <clears throat> 
again, of course, we'll demand that this should be non-negative. We want plasticity to be a dissipative process. Plasticity is essentially uh, crystallographic planes sliding past each other, right? As we mentioned a long time ago. That's frictional. That's a frictional process. And so there's dissipation of energy there. In fact, a lot of that energy is converted into heat. So if you ever touch a plastically deformed specimen just after it's been strained, you'll it'll be you'll find it's too hot to touch typically. <clears throat> okay. Um, So we will require, as usual, that, well, first of all, J sub K is positive and D is non-negative, so this whole thing is non-negative. And again, we, the, the conclusion we uh, saw before that if K dot is zero, then there's no dissipation, right? Because you get inner product with zero here. So at this stage, let's invoke a further hypothesis. So we, we haven't made any hypotheses yet. The only one, the only hypothesis we've made is that the dissipation is non-negative and anyone who believes in the second law of thermodynamics would accept that immediately. Let's make a slightly stronger hypothesis, which is that not only does the vanishing of plastic evolution imply no dissipation, but the other way, the conversely also, the vanishing of dissipation implies no plastic evolution. So instead of making this an if statement, let's strengthen the hypothesis uh, to make it an if and only if statement. So this, this certainly is in accordance with experimental observation. If, if, uh, if, there's, if there's no dissipation and no other effects like viscosity or heat conduction or diffusion are operating, then there's no plastic evolution either. Uh, so if we combine that assumption with the non-negative non-negativity of dissipation, that means the dissipation is strictly positive if and only if the plastic evolution is non-zero. Okay, so this is an additional hypothesis we'll introduce based on physical considerations and empirical observation. Okay, and we'll come back to we'll see it later how that's. Uh, uh, an, ascent, uh, an important ingredient in the in the overall theory. <clears throat> okay, um, we haven't yet talked about objectivity or invariance of uh, transformation formulas for variables under superposed rigid body motions, invariance of constitutive functions, and so on. Okay, so. And you, when you take continuum mechanics, you always talk about this kind of discussion. Uh, how do variables transform when you subject the overall body to a rigid body motion superimposed on a given deformation? And what are the implications for constitutive equations? So let's have that discussion here. I mean, we, so far we have talked about, we sort of talked about it in, in, a, in a way because Previously, when we we're talking about pure elasticity, and then later in the context of elastic plastic deformations, we're talking about elastic response and strain energy, we imposed the symmetry of the Cauchy stress. Right? And we concluded that, for example, W at H is equal to W at QH for any rotation Q, based only on the symmetry of the Cauchy stress. Okay. That argument was purely local in space. So it, it, it had nothing to do with the global rigid body motion at all. So the rotation in QH could, could vary from place to place in the body, unlike a superposed rigid body motion where the rotation is uniform over the entire body. <clears throat> so let's have a look at that issue. Okay, so from continuum mechanics, we know that in a superposed rigid body motion, the deformation transforms, let's say from chi to, we'll call it chi plus, where chi plus is the rotation tensor Q of T associated with the rigid motion, 
times chi, the original chi, plus a vector function of time alone. So the C of t is a translation in space, and Q of t corresponds to the rotation of the body. So Q is a proper orthogonal tensor. And if you take the gradient of this equation with respect to capital X, you will find that the gradient of chi plus, namely F plus, with the gradient with respect to capital X, will just become Q times gradient of chi, namely F. And that's because Q doesn't depend on capital X in this case. So you've all seen that discussion ad nauseum in, in the study of continuum mechanics. Immediately, we have a problem when we talk about the plastic and elastic factors of the deformation gradient, because this result hinges crucially on the existence of a deformation function whose gradient is F, right? But remember, G and H are not gradients. They're not gradients of any position fields. So we have to scratch our heads a bit and wonder how to proceed to characterize the transformation properties of H and G under superimposed rigid body motions. Well, for the moment, let's, let's revisit our discussion that we had before. <clears throat> uh, relating the Piola stress relative to an intermediate configuration to the Cauchy stress, which implies this. And if we invoke, you know, linear momentum balance and moment of momentum balance, we know that T is symmetric. So we use this, and this is a recap. We proceed exactly as we did earlier in the course to conclude this, that W at H is W at some rotation, any rotation, in fact, times h, any rotation q bar. I'm not calling it q because this, this discussion pertained to a material point. So q bar could vary from one material point to another. It could vary with x and t, unlike q a function of t alone in a superposed rigid body motion, unlike this q. So we need to distinguish these q's from the q's associated with the superposed rigid body motion. And that's why I use the notation q bar. We use this to conclude, I think it's page 21, if you look back, and since then, that W depends on H through a right Cauchy Green deformation formed from H, H transpose H, or equivalently through the elastic strain, right? So this is, we've had this discussion before. Okay. We also stipulated that in, in, in the case of small elastic strain, which is invariably the case for metals, that the strain energy should be positive definite. So that means if we write the strain energy in terms of the appropriate right Cauchy Green deformation, that's, that satisfies this inequality. W at H transpose H is never negative and equals zero if and only if the right Cauchy Green deformation based on H is equal to the identity, so that the elastic strain is zero. Okay, to get at this stage, we made two assumptions the symmetry of the Cauchy stress and the, posit the positive definiteness of the strain energy as a function of strain, which is appropriate for real metals because the elastic strain in any, any real metal is always quite small. And it takes energy to cause, take strain energy to produce an elastic strain in a real crystalline material, for example. We have not, and when we discussed these conclusions, we didn't say a word about superposed rigid body motions. Well, so we need an assumption now. Let's make an assumption, it's another hypothesis, physical hypothesis, that the energy density, its value, is insensitive to, super, to an actual superposed rigid body motion. Okay. That looks like this condition here, but it's not the same as that condition because we don't know that this Q bar has anything to do with the superposed rigid body motion. Nevertheless, physically, you would expect that merely rotating the body would not, uh, global, globally rotating it 
as a rigid body would not alter its energy density, not alter the energy in the body. Right? So this seems like a natural assumption. And it's often what we do even in neuroelasticity, although it's redundant because then we can invoke the um, symmetry of the Cauchy stress or vice versa, the invariance of the energy under superposed rigid motions implies the symmetry of the Cauchy stress. So one or, one or the other of those assumptions concerning superposed rigid body motions is redundant. Okay, so if W is invariant under superposed rigid motions, it should be the same if H is replaced by the value of H following a superposed rigid body motion. We know nothing about the form of this. We'll call it H plus, but we have no idea what of, its, of how it's related to H at this stage. But nevertheless, by the symmetry of the Cauchy stress, we know that W depends on H through its right Cauchy green tensor. So this would imply then this formula here, right? H plus transpose H plus, there should be a plus here, my apologies, is equal to a W hat at H transpose H. So it's important that you put the plus right here, which I missed. Okay. Okay, so I don't have any idea how H plus is related to H. But if I know H plus, I can define a tensor to be H plus times the inverse of the original H. So this is the inverse of the original H with a pre-multiplied pre by H plus. So that defines a tensor, let's call it Z. H plus then is Z times H. So if I substitute this back in here with the H plus here, I get this, right? Now, this W hat is a constitutive function. It's valid for all admissible values of H with positive determinant, right? The only restriction on H is that it should have positive determinant. It has to hold for all such H. Therefore, it holds when H is the identity as well, right? By the way, we want H plus to also be an admissible elastic factor of the deformation gradient, F plus, let's say. So it should also have a positive determinant, which means this Z we've introduced has a positive determinant also, okay? Okay, so as I said, this being a constitutive function, it has to be applicable for all H, therefore it must hold for H equal the identity, for example, in which case this equation reduces to this one. But our positive definiteness assumption stipulates then that the only way you can get, well, first of all, we assumed W hat at the identity is zero. In other words, W, U, energy U at zero strain is zero, right? And the positive definiteness condition then requires that the only way this can be true is if Z transpose Z is also the identity, right? So that the strain formed from Z is zero. This condition says that Z is orthogonal. This restriction says that it's a rotation. So I can, putting it back here, here, I can, I can conclude that H plus is indeed some rotation I know nothing else about times H. I'll call it Q bar, Q, Q bar because you know, it, 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 it's an arbitrary rotation, right? I'll just call it Q bar. I don't want you to confuse it with this Q bar, right? This came from the symmetry of the Cauchy stress alone. This is just any rotation, which I need to distinguish from Q of T associated with the superposed rigid motion. Okay, so where are we? We have H is FK. After the superposed rigid motion, I have an H I want to, I, I could decompose it in the same way. H plus now is F plus K plus, right? Where K plus is the value of K after a superposed rigid motion. I know, F plus is Q of T F, 
So I can put these together to assert that Q bar FK is this Q of T times F times K plus, right? Just from, just from this expression here. By the way, immediately from this, I can deduce that if I take the determinants of this equation, I get det Q bar, which is one, det F, det K is det Q, which is one, det F, det K plus. Divide out the det Fs and you get the determinants of K plus and K are the same. That, that turns out to be important. Um, <clears throat> okay, before we proceed, notice that the Cauchy-Green deformation tensors based on H or H plus are the same now because of this result. So the elastic strain is invariant under superposed rigid motions. Therefore, my intermediate Eschelby tensor, which depends only on the elastic strain, is also invariant under superposed rigid motions. Okay, so that's useful to know. Uh, what about the plastic deformation itself? How does it change under a superposed rigid body motion? Well, I'm stuck. I need another hypothesis. A reasonable one would be that a superposed rigid body motion does not cause dissipation in the material. If you rigidly rotate a body, you're not straining it, you're not doing anything to the internal structure of the material, and therefore you don't expect there to be any dissipation induced by that rigid body motion. And by the way, um, in, in, in all of continuum mechanics, the basic hypothesis is that the balance of energy, a thermodynamic equation, and also the entropy production inequality, the second third law of thermodynamics, have the property, the same property of being invariant under superposed rigid body motions. And since dissipation is a thermodynamic concept, it's entirely natural and appropriate to assume that the dissipation is insensitive to superposed rigid body motions. In other words, D plus is D. Now, for the variables uh, after a superposed rigid body motion, the way you would compute the dissipation is this way. You'd put all the plus variables into the definition of the dissipation. And of course, prior to the superposed rigid motion, we have this formula for the dissipation. Now, we, we just saw that JK plus is JK, and the assumption that D plus is D means the left-hand sides here are equal to each other. And that gives us a way to relate K plus to K. Okay, so let's do something similar to what we did before. We introduced a Z, which is H plus H inverse. This time, let's introduce another tensor, Y, K plus K inverse. And Y can depend not only on time, which I've indicated here, but also on the material point. So we've been a bit sloppy in the notation here. Y depends also on capital X. Okay, so whatever K plus is, at the moment I have no idea what it is, but I can, I can use it to define a tensor Y this way, where this is K inverse. So then K plus is Y times K. And if I, I'm focusing attention here entirely on a fixed material point, this, is, this whole discussion pertains to a material point. And then indeed I can take Y to be a function only of time because I've frozen the material point. Okay, uh, the determinants here, the determinant of y, j sub y is equal to one because the determinant of k plus is the determinant of k and, I'm, and this involves a division here, jk plus over jk and that's the ratio is one. Okay, so this notion of dissipation involves a time derivative. Let's specify an initial condition, let's say, we begin the superposed rigid body motion at some time t equal t zero. So at t equal t zero, k plus is equal to k. And then after t zero, k plus differs from k. So that means this tensor y at time t zero is the identity. Okay. 
let's compute the dissipation d plus using epsilon prime plus as we indicated, but epsilon prime is invariant under superposed rigid motion. So I can replace epsilon prime plus by epsilon. This is k plus inverse, right? And this is the dot of k plus from here. <clears throat> and then just work it out. And I get this, right? the second line. <clears throat> This first term gives me the dissipation prior to the superposed rigid body motion times the determinant j sub k. <clears throat> then I get epsilon prime times this business here. But this is equal to this by our assumption that the dissipation is invariant. So we get this restriction here in, on y dot. Okay. Now, this purports to, to hold for all plastic deformations, right? Notice that you know, the, the plastic deformation itself at a particular material point will depend on how we, cho how we uh, chose the reference configuration, right? The plastic deformation takes the intermediate state, sorry, sorry K takes the intermediate state, the vector space, to the intermediate, the, the, rather, the reference configuration. The reference configuration is a matter of choice, right? I can choose it as I please. So I could consider, for example, changing the reference configuration from reference configuration kappa one to reference kappa two. We've done this before using a map. Let's say cap x two, which points in reference kappa two, is some lambda times cap x one, which are all the points in reference one. And we, let's let R be the gradient with respect to cap X1 of that map. We've had this discussion when we talked about this location density. Okay. Now, I've, I focused attention on one material point here, a fixed material point. It's arbitrary, but it's fixed. I could choose the change of reference configuration lambda such that its gradient, R, coincides with, for example, the inverse of K1 at the specific material point in question, right? Now, R is a gradient. K1 is not a gradient. But if you look at only one point, you can't tell. The, you can't tell. It doesn't matter, right? Because, for example, K1 is some matrix, let's say. It's full of numbers, right? I could always arrange lambda so that its gradient at that particular point is the same matrix. And the fact that R is a gradient is then irrelevant because I'm only evaluating the gradient at a specific point, right? So I can exploit the freedom in the choice of reference configuration to arrange my map from one reference to another such that its gradient coincides with say the inverse of k at a specific material point and at a fixed time. This whole discussion also pertains to a fixed but arbitrary time. Okay. Now if you look back on page 70, and I think I'll repeat the formula down here somewhere, we had this formula down here. K based on reference number two is R times K based on reference number one. So if I use that, that's, that was on page 70. If I use that with this choice of R, I just get K2 is the identity. So if I apply this equality here using reference configuration kappa two, right? Then K would be the identity for that choice of reference configuration at that specific material point and at that specific time. And then I would get this equality here, where y2 is the value of k2 after the superposed rigid body motion. Now that k2, that's an actual plastic deformation, right? Because it's a plastic deformation after a superposed rigid motion, but it's still a plastic deformation. 
So this would read epsilon prime k2 inverse k2 dot equals zero, right? And our hypothesis we introduce of inherent dissipativity, that the only way to have plastic evolution is if there's no dissipation and vice versa, that would say that this k2 dot has to be zero. Or in other words, y dot has to be zero at that point and that time, both of which are arbitrary. So y dot is equal to zero at that time, but since the time is arbitrarily chosen, it's zero at any fixed time, which means for all time it's the same as its initial value, which we stipulated to be the identity, which is when the superposed rigid motion began. So that means k2 plus is the identity, which is the value of k2. So it looks like k, using reference configuration kappa 2, k doesn't change under, uh, after the superposed rigid motion. In other words, the superposed rigid motion has no effect on k2. <clears throat> well, we could transform back to kappa 1, which is an ar an, another arbitrary reference configuration, right? We use this formula that we had on page 70, I guess it was, this general formula. K2 plus then is R K1 plus because R is just a map from one reference to another, right? That's that this is this application of the same uh, formula on page, I guess on page 92, before and after superposed rigid motion. So the fact that K2 and K2 plus are both the identity means that RK1 is equal to RK1 plus, R is invertible, so K1 plus is K1. In other words, for any choice of reference configuration, you have K plus is K. In other words, the plastic deformation is unaltered by a superposed rigid motion. Okay. So let's see. I'm, Referring to page 94 here, let's go back to equation one. K plus is K, which means Q bar F is QF. Multiply through on the right by F inverse, and you just get Q bar equals Q. Okay, pardon, I want to make you dizzy here by doing this. So the Q bar we were talking about, which in principle could depend on cap X and T, now is that associated with the superposed rigid motion, the actual rigid motion, and therefore only a function of t. So what we've concluded are these transformation formulas under superposed rigid motions. F goes to F plus Q of T of F, as you know from previous work. H plus is Q bar H, which is now Q of T, the same Q of T here, and K doesn't change, okay? So we want to make use of these ideas when we talk about constitutive equations, which, as you know, should be such that they remain insensitive to superposed rigid body motions, or in other words, they should be objective. Okay. Okay, um, we're pretty close to the end of the time, and this is, I'm about to embark on a change of the subject here, talk about yield functions, and the notion of a work inequality. Remember when we were talking about elasticity, we invoked a work inequality asso associated with a cyclic process. From that, we deduced the existence of the strain energy function. We'll do the same here in the context of elastic and plastic deformations. And I think since we're close to the end, I think I'll stop here for today so that we can start fresh on this subject next time. Okay, any questions about what we've discussed today or previously? By the way, this used to be a controversial issue. How do these variables transform in plasticity under superposed rigid motions? And one found a variety of proposals in the literature, but essentially all of the modern literature since say the year 2000 is consistent with these this here, although 
the derivation based on this notion of invariance of energy and invariance of dissipation uh, is not in the literature actually, it's original stuff. Okay. If there are no questions, then I look forward to seeing you next week and have a great weekend. Thank you.